Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing We Have Come Into This House. We Gathered in his name to 
the garment of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Let's see we are able to go up and take the country. Hallelujah. Oh, we are able to go up.
Somebody say praise the Lord. The preaching, the teaching, what we believe, what we even sing has to change until we come to that realm of unchangeable truth where all things are revealed and where nothing is hidden from the body of Christ any longer. Now do you believe this morning that that realm already exists? There is a realm right now existing yes. that is unchangeable immutable yes. Yes. and that the whole battle has not been about you getting right or wrong are you going to the right church or the wrong church are you shaking the right hand or the wrong right but the battle the whole time the whole warfare has been about you pressing in yes. to that place you know exists where there is none of these changing factors that we've talked about some here this morning. Well, if you believe that, then you have an anchor. That is a hope. Steadfast. Whether the forerunner Jesus has entered into that within the veil. And as forerunner testified to the Father. That a whole other company of people and sons in the earth are coming right along behind him that are going to find the same realm and the same power and the same faith and the same glory and the same anointing and the same name and the same uh, uh, shining light upon them that is in that realm where he exists right now. Say praise the Lord somebody. What do you 
is the purpose of an anchor to hold the ship there even though the conditions around it are changing. Winds are shifting and waves are shifting and the tide is shifting and everything's shifting and the ship looks like it's being tossed around and it goes up and down, up and down, up and down but then when the water gets still again, guess what? The ship didn't move. It's right where it's always. Well, right where you what? Right where you anchored in glory to God. I want to tell you this morning, you're anchored. Because he's our anchor within the veil. <laughs> and I don't care how many waters tossed you last night and the night before and this week and last week and two weeks ago, it makes no difference. You've been anchored to that hope that is within the veil and there ain't nothing big enough, strong enough, powerful enough, mean enough to undo that anchor. Well, somebody say praise the Lord this morning because you are steadfastly connected to Him. Well, glory. Now, now, what do we do while all that thrashing is going on? I'll tell you what we do. We sing. We shout. We testify. We read the Word. We keep it in our heart fresh. We pray and we pray in the Holy Ghost and we prophesy and we lay hands and we speak the word and we decree and we declare. Can somebody say praise the Lord? We constantly get in places where we feel God a lot. Why? Because I'm just giving a tug on that anchor. I want to make sure that I've still got a connection. And I know you can't go by feelings, but when I feel the glory, I know I'm still connected Amen. to what's on the other end yes. of this thing. Amen. I couldn't go through it unless I was connected. That's right. And when you get connected, it don't matter what you're going through as long as He's anchored you. Amen. You won't fail the test. You'll pass it. Amen. You won't die. You'll live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. Well, glory. Lift your hands and praise Him this morning. I love to worship you, Lord. Yes, I love to worship you, Lord. For your name is glorious. It's exalted. when he was about 80, 
uh, 84, I think, and he told that for years, him and his wife had given 60% of their whole income. When I heard that, I heard that listening to a, a message he preached this weekend. I stopped right there and said, Lord, Lord, move, make it that way. Make it that way for me. I want to give him, I, oh, I'd love to be able to say I could do that for the work of God. Amen. I mean it. Woo. I want to be where any time I even think God said give something, I can go with it. Don't you? That's part of that steadfastness I want. Amen. I want to see it there. Amen. Hallelujah. So you be blessed as you give to the Lord this morning. Amen.
And the Lord told me the other week, He said, I'm going to teach you, start teaching you how you enjoy a life. And some folks don't think that's spiritual, but here's what the Lord said. He said, most folks can't never do just one thing. When they go to do one thing, they ought to be enjoying. They can't shut their mind down from worrying about a dozen other things and enjoy that moment I've given them. But the Lord said to me, there'd be much less sorrow in the earth if the people of God would learn how to focus on just one thing at the time instead of allowing a moment of rest and joy to be ruined by the stress of worry and fear of what is to come or what is to be. For instance, you go to sit down in a chair somewhere for about 30 minutes and just rest in Him. Amen. And all of a sudden, thousands of thoughts uh, began to attack your mind. And you worry about when you're going to get the money for this. And, isn't that right? Yeah. Worry about uh, what you're going to do about that rotten board on the back of the house. And what you're going to do about that uh, uh, car trouble. And what you're going to do about, oh yeah, my, my children. And then there's my job. And then there's what well, the Lord said to me that the key to uh, learning this joy of the Lord is to not feel guilty for giving up all the other worry to enjoy that one moment in the Lord. We feel guilty because we feel like we're not doing enough. Well, are you going to let Him do it? Or was you going to take care of it? That's what the Lord told Brother Hagin. He got out in the back seat to try to pray and coming back in the airport and he said that guy turned them corners so fast he was slinging him from one side of the car to the other and he thought, my God, nobody won't get healed tonight. I can't even pray a simple prayer. And the Lord said, was you going to heal him? Or was I going to heal him? Praise the Lord. And so I'm telling you that Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. Did he say it? For tomorrow and take care of itself. Yet how many moments do we spend in a day where tomorrow is not uh, subconsciously in our thinking? What we've got to do tomorrow. What we, where we've got to go. What it's going to be like when we get there. Well, glory. Hallelujah. I suppose maybe that stems to all of that uh, you know, tomorrow thinking is, is, is church oriented too. We is always taught to be a better day after a while. But if we don't never start enjoying the day in hand, we ain't never going to come in to the greatness and the fullness of God. And so one of the things is so wonderful about the glory is when you're caught up in the glory, you don't have another care in fact, when you get caught up in the glory, pain can't even manifest in your body. You can have an aching back or an aching arm or an aching leg and get so deep in the glory that you don't even feel that pain anymore. Amen. And so anyway, I'm throwing this in for good measure because of what the Lord just said. He said, I'll cause you to enjoy life. Amen. Amen. And I'm telling you what, I believe that's the, a great key to health coming up in people is when they no longer have the stress of worrying about life in general. Well, glory. It always has got took care of. It always will get took care of. So why worry? Uh, be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known with thanksgiving. And the God of uh, the God of peace shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Somebody say praise the Lord. Well, hallelujah. Amen. If you would please.
please open your Bibles to the third chapter of the book of John this morning, the third chapter of the book of John. We're taking our, been taking our main thought out of Joel, the second chapter. We've been teaching on the end time, moving the rain, latter in the former rain, falling in the first month, and the chain of events that God's getting ready to unloose on this earth, some of which is already loose. We're seeing come to pass right here in our own midst. Amen. But we're talking about these things, and God's been faithful ever meeting to give us insight, spiritual insight. The Lord told me a few weeks ago as well uh, to go on for a while and not worry about how deep things were. It is not the time the Lord told me to preach deep right now. It's the time to find that anointing and just flow in that anointing because things are happening when we get in that anointing and in that glory. So I've slowed down, just took my time telling you what I want to tell you. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so I just went right with the flow. And so far, God's has lost the key to this thing being the unveiling of a bridegroom and a bride. Amen. Now, back in Joel, the second chapter, we read these words. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. That's the second time he said it. Sanctify fast and call a solemn assembly. Let the priests weep between the ports and the altars. Then he said, I want you to assemble the elders. I want you to assemble the congregation. So we said that first to hand, there ain't nobody, this rain isn't going to come in on the body of Christ. This end time deal that God's getting ready to set forth. There is a move of God. Beyond Pentecost, God ain't through moving in His church. The Pentecostal says the Lord's through moving because He's ready for the rapture. The uh, kingdom people says that the Lord's through moving because He's done done everything when He didn't done no such. There ain't been a manifestation yet of the fullness of the unveiling of truth in the body of Christ. If it were, we wouldn't have a funeral parlor around us. Nobody in this church could die this you understand what I'm saying? In other words, this place would be overstalked and run this morning with no package getting delivered and blind eyes being opened and Hallelujah. cripples coming out of the wheelchairs and getting off the streets and dead men rising. Hallelujah. And until that happens, we are obligated to declare something yes. in this earth. Ooh, hallelujah. Because if you decree a thing, it shall be established unto you. And so if you don't start believing it now, it ain't never going to come to you. So you can't be believing it in that Sunday round. You've got to get in right now and say, yes, God has reserved something. He didn't just say, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He, Peter, didn't quote it that way at Pentecost. Peter said that he said, I will pour out of my spirit. Yet Jesus Christ had the spirit without measure. Meaning somebody on this earth has got to get a hold of that word and decide that they too have access to the spirit of God without measure. Glory to God. We've known in part. We've prophesied in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part is to be done away with. We see now through a glass darkly, but then face to face. We know in part, but then shall we know also, even as we are known. Amen. Second Corinthians 3, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory unto glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hallelujah. Liberty. When you get up in that perfection of God, there are no limitations. There are no holdbacks. There are no setbacks. Amen. We've operated in what we knew. We've done all we knew to do. And then we stand and wait for the direction of the Lord. But I this morning can hear the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry tree. I hear the wind blowing and it's blowing in. And I'm saying from every direction. 
direction uh, from the north, the south, the east, and the west. God has found a people in the earth who will carry this full measure of His Spirit, even as Jesus Christ did when He was in the earth. Right. Right. Well, glory. Right. So He said, get the elders together. Get the preachers, get the ministry together and tell them they need to go get in the glory. Press the Lord. Then get the congregation together. Then go gather the children. This move won't just be among the preachers. This is a move like none's ever seen. It won't be in groups and cliques. It'll affect the whole body of Christ. It'll come on the ministry. It'll come on the congregation. It'll come on the children. These children are going to prophesy. These children are going to get in the spirit and manifest God just like the adults do. They're going to have the fire of God on them just like the adults do. Somebody say praise the Lord. And then he said he can get them to suck the breast. Even the infants are going to feel the Holy Ghost. They're going to feel this outpouring of the latter and the former rain. We've had all word rains and they've been fine. We've learned a lot. We've had all spirit rain. But this rain coming now ain't like anything we've ever had before. It's the word and the spirit joined together, married together as one. Glory be to God. And there's falling that we've had a lot of people that knows the word. They're just so deep they can lose you. They know the word and know it in great measure. But they're deader than a hammer. They ain't got no life on them. You can't stand to listen to it. As good as it is, about all you can do is read it. You can read it and it'll bless you. But then when you get in their midst and they start talking, there ain't no life there. I'm preaching back here shouting now. There ain't no life manifesting. Amen. Then they got all these people that's got a heavy anointing, but I don't want to hear them preach too much. I love to see them work the gifts. And I love to see them lay hands on people. And I love for them to sing and shout and get the people up in a high realm of the spirit of worship. But when they start preaching, it's all old order coming out. They ain't got no revelation of the now God and the now truth. So I want you to know God's ending both sides and bringing both sides together into one reign. And not only are they going to be anointed to preach with the great depth of the Word of God and His truth, but they're going to have the Spirit on them without measure. Somebody say praise the Lord. In other words, the Lord's going to balance this thing. It's been out of balance. It's been out of balance. Can you say amen? Some churches never have a chance, time, when their people can flow in the anointing. Never. They don't allow the gifts. They don't allow prophecy. They don't allow all this stuff. That, then there's other folks that'll allow too much of anything. They let people get up and they don't even know where they come from and take a whole meeting over. And they say stupid stuff that hurts a lot of people. Out of balance. But the Holy Ghost is getting ready to shift this thing. And it's going to balance in word and in spirit, latter and former. Well, glory to God. Now that's a key word, balance. If it balances just right, everybody will weigh out equal. Won't be one man ahead of the other. Won't be all this bishop and archbishop. And somebody wants elder. And somebody wants deacon. They made one the deacon called, called his aunt and said, What's the deacon? And made him one he didn't even know he was. Can you say praise the Lord? Uh, some want to be called apostle. Well, if you be called Christ, he was all of that. Everybody in this place today can be apostolic. <laughs> they can be prophetic. They can be evangelizing. They can be pastoral. They can be teachable. Somebody say yeah. praise the Lord. You don't believe that's all for ranking purposes, right. do you? No, the rain of the Spirit that God is uh, pouring out in this hour is going to put all that straight. Right. 
God's going to balance this whole ministry. He's going to balance out. Now, I want you to listen good to me. He's going to balance out every realm of this message. He's going to balance out the kingdom message. He's going to balance out the reconciliation message. It's out of balance right now. Some folks don't believe in reconciling nobody but them. They weigh too heavy. <laughs> they weigh too heavy on one side. And then another group thinks he's reconciled them so they can all go to the gym joint and the beer house. And he's reconciled them so they can all quit going to church. I believe I'll run a while. I think I'm doing good this morning. Amen. He didn't say latter rain. He didn't say former rain. He said both of them. In the same month. Some folks are so reconciled, they don't even think you need to go through Jesus to get born again. They say you can go through Muhammad. They say you can go through Buddha. They say all roads lead to God. Well, that's a lie, friend. The Bible said Jesus himself said if a man comes any other way, he's the same as a thief and a robber. All come by one way. Christ is a door. Somebody say, praise the Lord. You say, what about them people that don't know God? Don't you worry. He's able to reveal himself to people. He don't need a preacher to reveal himself to nobody. He'll talk to them on the bar stool. He'll talk to them in the crack house. He'll glory be to God. He'll talk to them when they're in the gutter so drunk they don't know their name. He'll call their name and tell them who he is. So the reconciliation message is not out of balance. It needs both reigns, the latter and the former reign. It needs somebody that's got a word to preach and an anointing to manifest with that word. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. I mean, I love all I love all people, love love both sides of them. I really do. I want them ones that don't think God reconciles everybody but their denomination. I want them to get out of that denomination. And I want that other bunch to leave, get out of the bar and get back over here in church with us and worship God with us and get in the spirit with us and do what they're supposed to do. And in order for that to happen, I can't make it happen. I can preach all the sermons in the world that won't make it happen. I can pray all the prayers in the world that won't make it happen. But if a mighty move of the Spirit and the winds of God can blow Amen. through this earth in a final end time, end of the age, setting up for that age which is to come, glory to God, we're not going to pass into that age of all ages half weak, watered down, sickly, dead, Amen. crippled, and everything else. But but he will present it unto himself a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. When I was a kid, the preachers used to say, uh, talking about the rapture, said, what ain't right, he'll make right when he gets here. No, he's making it right right now, brother. He's here. Hallelujah. He's making it right right now. Hallelujah. So he's going to rain on the elders. And he's going to rain on the congregation. And he's going to rain on the children. And he's going to rain on the infants. Well, glory to God. Hallelujah. And when he does, something's going to happen to make this chain of events begin to go forth. And things are going to pop like that. I mean, it's just going to fall in place like clockwork. And here's the thing that will make all that happen. He said, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and let the bride come out of her closet. And immediately when he declares this to be, here comes the turning of the captivity of Zion. Everything turned around. When that bride and that groom became united fully as one and were unveiled in the earth as that which God ordained it to be, then the captivity of Zion was turned around. Be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice for the Lord hath turned your captivity. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we preach Sunday morning about Matthew 25. Ten virgins. Five wives, five foolish. Five wives of they who have come into some knowledge of the truth that God ain't through yet. Yeah. He's not wrapping it up. 
like they all say. In fact, he's unwrapping a new move, a new gift, and a new anointing. Somebody say, praise the Lord. He's unwrapping something. He ain't tying up the loose ends. He's letting out the ropes. He's lengthening the cords. Woo! Hallelujah! He ain't getting us ready for the great home going. He's getting us ready for a coming, all right. He's coming unto us as the former and the latter rain. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. He's coming unto us as a bridegroom. And he's coming unto us to take out that name, that bride rather for himself. Right. And unveil something new. Union, oneness. They got to go in the holy place. And stay a while. Because she going to conceive something. He called a man child. You can't have sonship. Before you have brideship. There's got to be a bride and a groom. Before there can be a son. Amen. He said let the bride go forth out of his bridegroom. Go forth out of his chamber. Them five wives said, yes, there's something for me in the future. And it ain't the rapture neither. God's got something right here for me. I'm going to take oil in my vessel, not just my lamp. I got the Holy Ghost, but I'm going to take me a vessel full. Ooh, I'm believing for another day of the outpouring of God. Right? Five foolish, so they didn't believe there's nothing left. No, but Jesus is finished. I'm not going to do anything else in here. He's through. I got, I'm saved, sanctified, filled, filled with the Holy Ghost, packed up, prayed up, ready to go up. Yeah. I'm preaching, ain't I? And the Bible said at midnight, there's three people awake. Three people awake. There's all virgins. There's all hidden ones. They was all born again. They all had the Holy Ghost. But one group had stepped a toe over out of the church age into the kingdom age and said, my God, we shall rule and reign with him in this earth. Praise the Lord. And when they got out in the age of that age, they took, and you know what the Bible said? Said that when the fool woke up, he said to the wife, give us some of your oil. And they wouldn't put new wine in old wine skin. said, no, we're not giving you our oil. You still got that same old order around them, mess you don't believe in nothing we believe in. We can't pour that over in, in, in your man. They said, but you but you know what they could have done? They could have walked on with them in the light of what they had seen. But them old religious folks would rather go back to the old merchant, the old realm, and buy some more oil where they'd been about it. And what did they do? They missed the coming of the bridegroom because they was off yonder trying to get that church to fill them up one more time. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So let's just let that alone, shall we? Amen. Three people are away. Watchman is away. God's got a ministry away. Right. The bridegroom was away, and the bride herself was away. Glory be to God. Yes. Then we come back Sunday night and went through John 2. That Jesus went to a wedding in Cana on the third day, and that marriage, they run out of wine. They couldn't drink that old wine no more. That old round run out. That old way of doing it run out. That old system run out. And they had to have more wine. And Jesus, glory to God, comes in in the third day, which is also the seventh day. It's the third day from, hallelujah, it's the third day from Jesus, but it's the seventh day from Adam, amen. And He comes in on that third day and produces a new wine for drinking. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost out pouring was there and they had experienced it, but now it came time for a a new way, a new realm, a new move, a new way. And he brought in new wine. And it was the best wine. And it was saved for the last generation. Glory to God to lift up their voice and say, men have always held back the best wine. Amen. And give it or get the best wine first and then slopped us over with something after we were drunk. But you waited till we ran out and there wasn't nothing else to drink. And then you Ooh, you brought us uh, the best wine and saved it from the last hour. And I'm telling you, that's the way it is. They have wine. They don't have any wine. But a new day has dawned on the body of Christ. And now ministers rising up and saying, Give me them six water pots. Give me men who are full of the word of God. And I'll cause them to birth a new wine in this earth. Fresh wine, the best. 
time to read the verse that you can read, read along with me in John 3. Hallelujah. <laughs> John's been baptized. John's a wilderness preacher. He don't preach in Jerusalem where everybody else preaches. You won't get hold of this word, you've got to get in the wilderness to get it. Right now it ain't in the big cathedral. It ain't in the big audiences. It ain't in the huge crowds. God's changing that now, though. He's raising up some guys that are getting their foot in the door. Amen. Amen. And he's certainly using the printing page to make this happen because your books can go where you're not allowed. A lot of these uh, <coughs> preachers will tell you that there are pastors of great large churches who absolutely believe what we're teaching you is the truth, but they can't preach it because if they do, they'll lose their titers. Yeah. If they lose their titers, they'll lose their uh, mortgage payments on the church building. I'd rather be under a tin roof than a cow pasture with 200 that could shout the walls down over this truth as to have to hold on to a bunch of Bunch of, bunch such as that, shall we just say that, amen. I'm trying to be nice these days, nicer. Nicer, not necessarily nice, but nicer. And the fact that the, the, the preachers, uh, uh, Lynn House told one of them preachers, he said, you don't understand. When God does bring your people in the truth, they'll know you've lied to them. And they'll leave you without mortgage payment anyway. Well, glory. If you can't preach it in the finance building, bless God, sell the thing. And go buy one you can pay for and preach it there. My God, I wouldn't let nothing like that hold the truth back. Somebody say praise the Lord. Woo, hallelujah. Wilderness preaching ain't popular. That's the hard cap. Right, yeah. That's down there where you can't rub, rub elbows with the rest of them. Yeah. That's down there where you don't poll for a congregation. You can't steal sheep in the wilderness. Some of these churches in this county is built off everybody else's flock. Some of them come out of here and some of them come out of the denominational churches and some of them come out of a few other churches. Ain't nobody in there they birthed in there by prayer. They've got the ministry of fellowship. They go around and draft church members. That's called sheep thieves. That's called proselyting. Jesus said, Woe be unto you Pharisees you come pass about land and sea to make one proselyte and said, when, when they're made, you make them a twofold child of hell worse than yourself. And now what the Bible said, these churches said, no, a lot of these churches, they're not filling up because them preachers is fast and pray for God to give them a move of God. They're filling up because they run from pillar to post, polling and drafting and they're drafting with anything. Donuts, coffee, pizza, Hallelujah. Am I preaching or meddling? I meddled. I got on the old woman's stuff, haven't I? Amen. You're preaching. Hallelujah. 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 I don't want to be that. If I got to preach to start with in the wilderness, well, glory. I'll just go on out there, put on that old camel hair, and eat that wild locust stuff. Yeah. I've eaten up them locusts. Them locusts have stripped the tree. Yeah. Calls glory to God, the saints of God's joy to live wither away. But if I eat the locusts with the word of God, hallelujah, and apply the sword of the spirit of God to it, then I believe God will take the whole swarm out of the tree and let there be a new tree come forth. The Bible says there's hope of a tree if it be cut out. Yes. Amen. I'm going to get my text in a minute. Hallelujah. I, right now, I'm just listening to the Lord and telling you what He's telling me. Somebody better be willing to preach in the wilderness. 
This message ain't big right now, but it will be. It will eventually be the only message they are. Only some of what I'm preaching to you this morning, God will also move that on. Even some of what we hold to now, we'll look on in that hour and say, that was old order. Yeah. He'll get it out of us. Every ounce of it. And then, uh, the other thing is, when you're out in the wilderness, only the Spirit can draw people to your church when you preach in the wilderness. Flyers can't do it. Salesmen pitch can't do it. Renting billboards is the side of the road won't do it. Giving out free food won't do it. Uh, running a soup kitchen won't do it. I ain't got nothing again, none of them things, but that ain't going to fill up a church it's where the preacher's preaching the wilderness message. Ain't nobody wants to hear the wilderness message, but I'll tell you what, if you're going to see that bride revealed, you're going to have to have a wilderness preacher. Because the Psalms of Solomon said, Who is this that cometh up out of the wilderness? As a bride. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God with pillars of smoke, smelling of myrrh. Somebody say praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, brother uh, Zachariah, he couldn't even say John's name. His speech was tied up. He couldn't talk for nine months lest he dare say anything to hinder that supernatural thing from coming forth. He started to say, this can't be. My wife ain't going to have, can't have children. And the angel said, well, I'll tell you what will be. Your tongue's going to be tied up for about nine months, brother. You're not going to talk. <laughs> Didn't he do it? He come out on the steps and they said, my God, he's seen an angel. Elizabeth was over there, glory to God, getting bigger every day, pregnant by a miracle. God's New Testament, Abraham and Sarah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Ooh. And Mary didn't know nothing about what was going on. And Elizabeth didn't know about Mary. But Mary walked in the door of Elizabeth's house and reached her hands up to greet her. Oh, and when she did, John the Baptist met Jesus for the first time while they were both in the womb. And Jeremiah said, Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee, I ordained thee, and I called thee. And when John knew who Jesus was, he was instantly baptized in the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb and began to dance in the Spirit in his mother's womb. And Elizabeth, by prophecy, said to Mary, Blessed be thou, who the mother of our Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen, amen, amen. Six months ahead was John the Baptist. Now, I know he was a preacher. I know he was a prophet. I know he was a cousin. But let me tell you what he ultimately became. The best man. He was the friend of the Bridegroom, glory to God. He had a purpose behind it all. He was growing into something. He had the bride under his care until the groom came forth. And then he was to turn the bride over to the groom and rejoice at the sound of his voice. John came neither eating nor drinking. And you said he had a devil. The son of man came both eating and drinking. And you said, Behold a glutton and a wine bibber. Whom shall I liken this generation unto? You're like them that sit in the city. And we've piped to you. And you won't dance. And so we decided maybe you wanted to cry. So we mourned unto you. 
And you wouldn't lament. You wouldn't weep. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, how often would I gather thee underneath my weeds like a mother hen would gather her chicks, but you would not. And because you missed the day of your visitation, your house shall be left unto you desolate. I'll take it out of one house and I'll move it to another. John the Baptist is out there preaching, repent, repent, repent. What's that mean? Turn away from what you're doing. Turn out of it. Change your mind. Come out of that old way. Get out of it. John was baptizing, but he wasn't baptizing people into. He was baptizing them out of. He was baptizing them out of that old order. And old Zachariah, his father, was waiting on the birth, and then they got the, the circumcision at eight days and was ready to name the child, and everybody was trying to name the child Zachariah. They wanted to name him that for a specific purpose. Zachariah was a priest in the old order. And surely John would follow suit. But Zachariah knew the Lord had visited him and gave him new marks for that generation. I believe in a marked generation. I believe in one that bears the seal of God to bring forth a special word. And the Bible said, you get blessed this morning. I don't mean to be all over the place, but I'm just listening. The Bible said that Zechariah said, run and got him a tablet and said his name shall be called John. And when he wrote the word John, the name John, his tongue was loosed and he began to glorify God. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. And then Jesus comes up and here's Mary pondering all this in her heart. Knowing their scenes unfolded before her, the world could not yet receive. Wondering just how he would come forth, how would he come about, if he is to be the deliverer, the Savior, the Son of God, how is this all going to manifest? How is it going to play out? Thirty years of age. Thirty years of age. John is six months older than Jesus. John changed his message a little bit. His first message was repent and be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now that little thing there at hand means that it's right in our midst. It's at our grasp now. It's no longer something we can't see or enter. It's right here, uh, hallelujah, at our reach. But then he began to talk about because the Lord caused some people to start asking him some questions. They went out in that wilderness and said, Who are you? Who are you? You preach different than anybody we've ever heard. You don't dress like we do. You don't even believe like we do. We sent our preachers out there to check you out and you told them they needed to get down in the same water. <laughs> and get baptized too. Now who are you? And he said, Oh glory. What, how did he anoint himself? How did he anoint himself? How did he announce himself? He said, first of all, I'm the voice. Right. Not the echo. Right. I'm the voice right. of one. Of one. Amen. Now, now let me tell you one thing. There ain't no two voices around here. Yeah. There ain't but one voice declaring this message. Yeah. These trumpets don't have uncertain sounds. And old John the Baptist sent out the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is prophetic fulfillment of what is Isaiah 40, ain't it? 39, 40. That's, I can't remember. Is it 40 or 39? Where he said, Behold my messenger. Behold my. <laughs> it says, Behold the one that sent before me, said, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Said, I've been sent. Glory to God said when he started talking to watchmen, he's going to get up and say, Comfort you, comfort you, my people, and tell her that her warfare is accomplished. Yeah. And I'll give her double for her trouble. Glory to God. That's how I say authority, I think. Right. And the Bible said, whenever uh, John said, I'm the voice of one crying, crying, crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, <coughs> make his path straight. He said, I am not he, but he that is to come is mightier than I. Right. 
said he was before me. Now wait a minute. John's six months older than Jesus. But John said Jesus was before me. He's preferred before me because he was before me. Right. Whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. His fan is in his hand, and with it he doth thoroughly purge his floor, separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat he'll gather into the garner, the chaff he'll burn up with unquenchable, glory to God, unquenchable fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's coming in fanning the flame. Right. He ain't coming in to make it quieter. He's not coming in to tone it down. He's coming in to make it bigger, fanning the flame. Somebody say praise the Lord. Then John got on down in the first chapter of John. He changed his message some more. It got more real. He said, now, there's stand one among you whom ye know not. Standing right among us now. He ain't off over yonder in Jerusalem no more. He's standing right here among us. We know him not. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the next day, the next day, John seeth, seeth Jesus. Day before that, he was looking at him, didn't know him. The next day, he seeth Jesus. Yeah. Well, glory to God. And sit in the midst of that whole crowd, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus went splashing, splashing out in the river Jordan. He made that water, scooped that bed out with his own hand. This is the only time in Scripture he'll ever walk in water. After that, he'll walk on water, but he'll never walk in it again. He walked in that water, laid himself in John's hands, and looked at John, and John said, Oh, Lord, I have need to be baptized to thee. That's about like Peter said. Don't wash my feet. When Jesus got through talking to him, he said, Don't just wash my feet. Wash my head also. Somebody say, Praise the Lord. Jesus said, Suffer it to be so, for thus it fulfilleth all righteousness. And when Jesus was come up straightway out of the water, he weren't sprinkled. We don't sprinkle. You don't go down in a grave and they just sprinkle you with dirt. In a grave you get buried. We bury in baptism. We don't sprinkle nothing. And you say, praise the Lord. And since we're the bride and we're not ashamed of His name, when we get buried, we get buried in that name that we married into. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, glory, when John brought up Jesus' wet, dripping body, lo, the heavens were open. They ain't never shut again. They ain't never shut again. And the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. He gets on us in fire because we got impurities to be burned out. But Jesus knew no sin. He had no impurities. So the gentle dove could come on him. Amen. Doves are peace offering. In the old text, you couldn't bring a ram bring a dove. Jesus was called the lamb, and now we have the dove. Further witness that he's a complete sacrifice. And whenever he's brought up, and the Bible said, This is my beloved son. And he told everybody where he was, God did. He said, in whom I am. You don't know where God is? He's in Jesus, reconciling the world unto himself. And John come up, and you don't hardly hear nothing about John no more until Jesus preaches about him when he gets in prison. Jesus waits till he goes to prison to preach about him. Hallelujah. In this third chapter of the book of John, we have some things revealed to us that's not commonly talked about. Number one, did Jesus baptize with water? Yes, he did. You can read it right there in the third chapter of the book of John. You hear all these people. That, see, that's what I mean when I was talking a while ago about the out-of-balance uh, teaching. 
there's some, some, some people that just flat out thinks I'm going totally against reconciliation because I take people up in the baptistry and baptize them. Oh, brother, haven't you got out of doing that? Why, no, I ain't got out of doing it. Right. If Jesus baptized them, I'm going to baptize them. Besides that, if you ever got in there with me and felt what we feel in that water bag there when they slang it around, you'd get in there, you'd run in there. And you say amen. Man, they fall out that water, shout in that water, get the Holy Ghost in that water. It's a beautiful sign. Why don't I want to cut that out? Amen. But anyway, Jesus was baptizing, and then he let his disciples baptize with him, and they were baptizing more people than John was. In fact, all the people that was going to John's baptism, glory, started going to Jesus' baptism. They sensed that. I'm closing, I promise. The Bible said that John's disciples came to him and said, Jesus and his disciples are baptizing more than we are. We ain't got nobody left to baptize. Somebody said, right. praise the Lord. That for good measure, so you won't say I didn't read your scripture this morning. <laughs> I'll read you two verses that prove out my, what I'm saying to you. This is verse uh, 27 of chapter 3 of the book of John. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Come on, man. <laughs> Glory to God. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, You was there and heard me say that I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride, well, glory, is the bridegroom, my God. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He has come in now to lay claim on that that is rightfully his. Rightfully his. Amen. And he said, This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase. I must decrease. Hallelujah. Somebody say yes, Lord. I'm talking about the friend of the bride. What is John going to do? He's going to hand over. He's been out there preaching. He's called that bride out in the wilderness. Well, praise the Lord. I said, oh, didn't you know that the church is not the bride? Well, and I tell you what you do. If you don't believe the church is the bride, number one, you will have to give up his name. You have to be praying in his name, preaching in his name, or baptizing him. You can't use nobody's name unless you take them in marriage. I'll tell you something else you have to do. You have to quit feeling the Lord. Because you can't be intimate with nobody unless you're married to him. Praise God. So if you don't believe you're the bride, don't you never let me hear you use his name. There ain't no one group of people that, that, that's reserved for the bride of Christ, but all them that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb is his bride. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, glory. I feel good when I show. Amen. So we say, well, I thought the church was the body. It is. It's the body. It's the son. It's the bride. Well, praise the Lord. Why ain't it if Jesus can be a father? And if he can be the son? And if he can be the Holy Ghost? Why can't I be the bride and the body? And the son, God. Can you say praise the Lord? One thing they get clear right now, there's neither male nor female. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. All are one in Christ Jesus. 
Yet the first said many are called, but few are chosen. So is everybody called in to the bride? Sure they are. Well, who's the chosen ones? I would imagine them who choose to put on a wedding garment. Well, glory. Even if you're going to make me fun of it. Even if everybody's going to say, why are you wearing that wedding garment? There ain't been no wedding. There ain't been no rapture. There ain't been no. Right. Well, bless God, I got tired of waiting until I got over young yeah. and put it on. Yeah. I decided to start wearing it right here. Yeah. Well, glory. <laughs> I decided to start wearing it right here and right now. John didn't say that one day after a while we'd all be swept off and become the bride of Christ. That's what the church world said. Not John. John said, I was a friend of the bridegroom. I called them people out in the wilderness. That's the church in the wilderness, you see. Moses had a church in the wilderness. He said, I called them out here. I oversaw them. I kept them safe. But when I heard the voice of the bridegroom, I knew it was time for me to decrease. Uh, I now rejoice, said John. Woo! Because the bridegroom has come to make himself known. Ooh, that puts two dads on my glory box. Say, man, said, I've come to, <laughs> I've come to make the bride to know he's here. But if he's here, why should I keep telling her that he's coming? Are you reading that yet? Why should I keep telling them he's coming if he's already? Woo! Hallelujah! Uh -huh. Oh yes, if he's already here, why should I keep telling him he's coming? I'm telling the whole son of my Hallelujah! 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 He didn't say I come after a while. He didn't say I'm coming a few years. He said I come quickly, quickly. My God, don't you reckon it may mean you just haven't noticed he's here yet? He didn't lie. He's come. In the Holy Ghost. Yes. He's coming as a bridegroom. He's coming the, uh, right now in the former and the latter rain. He said, I will come unto you as the rain. Somebody say, Praise the Lord. He's come as high priest. He's come as Savior. He's come as Holy Ghost baptizer. Amen. So John said, I'm not going to stand out here and say he's coming now. He's already here. I'm going to change my message. I'm going, what are you going to do, John? Are you going out there and rebuke them? He said, no, no. The friend of the bridegroom starts shouting when they hear that the bridegroom, his voice, his voice ain't here without him. I'll tell you that right now. If his voice is here, he's here. And he said, I heard his voice. You know what that means, boys? That means he's here. And if he's here, and I'm sliding back right. out of the picture. And the only test, this is my closing thought, the only test ever came to John was he knew he was the last one on the menu before the new course was introduced. He was the last item. And he, he knew it. And he is in prison. Shut up for preaching the gospel. And he sent his disciples to Jesus. What he wanted to know was, can I go ahead and fade off of here? Right. As long as I'm around, there's still some of the old around. Right. But I can't get out till I know, till I know, right. till I know that it's time for you to establish who you are in this earth. This is the reason Jesus replied back with not John, you know I'm Jesus. John, you know I'm God. That ain't what he said. He told him these words to let him know the kingdom had come. The blind see, the deaf hear. Yes, God. <laughs>
some name to describe who he was in Mary's house. He sent word to tell him the kingdom of heaven has come to the earth, John. The law can go on now. Get out of here with my blessing. I've come in power and in glory to reveal myself to these people. And that friend of the bridegroom rejoiced to hear the voice of the bridegroom. My God, that's why the rain's going to fall like it is. Because a bunch of people in the earth have found out that the bridegroom is here. He's here. He is here. He's not over yonder. He's not out there. Jesus said, as the lightning cometh in from the east and shineth all the way to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Let me tell you preachers, you've got a duty and obligation to your people to quit lying to them. I'm not talking to people in this room, but whoever might listen to this clip or whatever, you're lying to your people. You're telling them every Sunday that if they'll do good and be better and live right, they'll go to be with Jesus after a while. And you're lying to them because Jesus has never left this planet Earth. You don't have to go anywhere to be with Jesus. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He's with you always, even to the end. So I submit to you in Jesus' name this morning that this phase and part of this message is to reveal to you that if the voice of the bridegroom's being heard, that means the bridegroom's here among his bride. And the hour is come and now is when somebody gets in the spirit of worship and tunes their ear in to that heavenly realm and begins to hear that voice of that bridegroom, the spirit and the bride say, come this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So there you have it. That's a friend of the bridegroom. That's the best man. Hallelujah. That's the one preached the word that got you out of that realm you was in. So he can introduce you to a new world of living. A new way of thinking. Well, glory be to God. But even then, sometimes, the friend of the bridegroom that helped get you out of it ain't enough for you to go on into it all the way. You got a little book. It stirred you up. Heard a little tape. It stirred you up. Right? You was over there nesting in your denominational nest. And then somebody stuck a book in your hand. And you read it and it shook up your doctrine. What was that? That was a friend of the bridegroom. Ooh, hallelujah. Somebody then dropped a CD in your lap. You went home, plugged, plugged, plugged it up, put it in, started listening to it, and said, Oh God. You knew, you knew, you knew that the boat was rocking. Who was that done that? That was a friend of the bridegroom. But you had to finally make your decision. Glory to God. To go even beyond the friend and get to the bridegroom himself so that you could become one with him. Well, praise the Lord. So this morning, listen. When, when we get this understanding and start decreeing, look at the power just talking about it that you feel. I mean, I can feel current in my system right now just moving constantly. Don't you know if we'll get the full red and to the point that we'll decree it openly and declare the thing, that we'll see just exactly what the prophecy will unfold for us like it did as it was prophesied. There will be an unveiling chain of events, an absolute reaction to the truth of this knowledge we've received. And just as sure as I'm sitting here, gladness will break out. Joy will break out. Power will break out. Wine will start to flow. Oil will come forth. Wheat will come forth. And He will give us the former and the latter rain as He's promised in the first month. Hallelujah. God bless you, saints. We love you so much. Hey, man, I kept you a little while longer today, but I'm not sorry for it because I had to get there sometime. Amen. But I love you, and we'll be back in here tonight. And uh, we'll see what things the Lord has for us this evening. And don't forget on Wednesdays, we're teaching a whole series of messages on the glory of God. This is just wonderful what the Lord's saying. And so you don't want to miss that either. So you be blessed. Amen. You're dismissed. Hallelujah.